Oops. Oh, okay. Oh, can someone mute the my laptop? No. Um. All right. There's just a there's a mute button on the top left. Okay. Okay. Um, cool. Um, yeah, welcome everyone to Five Minutes of Fame. And uh, yeah, and to online people, also welcome. Um, we're gonna, we have a few people listed. Um, so I think we're just gonna do this in a pretty organized or like, Loosely or, or, or fashion. So, for people who don't know, every person gets five minutes, um, give or take, and then we get um, have a round of questions, and then we move on. Um, there is a speaker, but the speaker is for people who are remote. Um, so, if you hear remote people presenting, they'll present through uh, these speakers here. Um, yeah. Uh, does anyone in, want to go first? All right. Um, Apex or, or tinfoil chat, I believe. All right. Um, go to the Dixie and then you get. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'm on stage so I can see that. Is this the mic? Yeah, let's see your there. there. Yeah. Okay. So, thanks for coming. This is the group of us working on secure endpoint messaging. Um, Mostly noise videos, but one guy at Vancouver Hackspace um, is going to talk. Can you speak a little louder? You're getting something drowned out in my head. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. So, all the feedback. So, the problem we're trying to solve is if you want to communicate securely nowadays, you would use end to end encrypted messaging, which is good, except for the device you're using on it on is largely insecure. For a number of reasons. You're doing the encrypting, networking, and decrypting of your messages on the same device. So there are many ways malware can get in, see what's on the screen, capture your keyboard. The good news is someone had open source a solution for this, which we really like. We think this is like hardware and encryption paradigm. Um, it's going to be the winner here. Um, and this is kind of Marcus and Tala. Just check out GitHub. So here's like an overview at a high level of that architecture. Um, you have three computers per endpoint with three physically separated chips. So you type your message in, it's encrypted, sent down to an network computer where it's sent out. Likewise, when you receive encrypted messages, it's sent to a third chip where it's decrypted in human visual text. Um, 
Um, so why is this so secure? If you get malware on your network device, they can access that chip. But there are one-way valves to prevent the backwards flow of information, but over here with these like uh, shutdown symbols. So the malware can commit your network chip, it cannot go upstream, but it can go down. However, once it's on that chip, it's locked in and you can't get back out, thus protecting your data from being exfiltrated. So this is the data dot, one of the ones that we have that actually ensures this one-way flow of information. And at the heart of it is this IC, an optocoupler, that contains just an LED and a photoreceptor with a physical gap in between. Uh, so these are physically separated computing disks. We're trying to get this, this technology from development here and most of out and accessible to as many people as possible. So this means like Slink device, um, Good UX, low price one. And here's Colton to give us a little bit more detail as to where we are on that process. So today we're introducing our dev kits. Uh, we're building these with off-the-shelf components, uh, existing software, so that we can have people in our network uh, using these devices as soon as possible. Uh, the dev kits are also our platform for testing hardware and software changes uh, that we, as we iterate towards the math market handhelds. Um, to get to that point, we need to have lower cost parts, um, lower power requirements, and a smaller attack surface. Uh, so we've already moved from Ubuntu to Alpine Linux, throwing out hundreds of software dependencies that we don't rely on. Uh, we have running on ARM, running on Raspberry Pis, which means that we can run these things off battery power. Uh, and ideally, we'd like to move to the source and destination machines running our own C code and microcontrollers so that we don't rely on any operating system at all. Um, so these are all in service of getting to that uh, mass market handheld device. Looking immediately forward, there are some issues that we know we're, we're facing. Um, one is a big UX thing we're trying to solve with like manually typing public keys. That's 84 characters. Um, we're sure if you guys were feeling the creativity for this problem, we could have been overcome it. Um, another problem that we're facing is shortage of Raspberry Pis. You'd be surprised how difficult it is to get these here now. So if anyone out there has Raspberry Pis, so people buy them off you if you want to sell them to us. Um, this is a real problem for us. Um, is there anything else that you guys want to contribute with, or you think we're doing something wrong to see something we don't? Come to our forum. Let us know. Um, privacy is not dead. In fact, the fight for privacy has just begun. Come join us. So we'll take questions. Since the pies are not available here, not immediately online. Our pies are in the mail. There's like a monthly time on ordering pies. So we'd like to start building these sooner than that. So we'd like to buy your pies at market rate. All right, thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, I wonder if I can plug this in. It's so plain. Oh, uh, uh, so that's real ready. Yeah, we know how much. Oh. All right. Does anyone want to go next? Okay. Oh, you have a USB stick with the presentation. Okay. Well, other than that, I'm not sure what you can put it on this. You can maybe put it on the noise bridge desktop, this desktop here. You can put it on here and then load it. Okay. 
Uh, the USB, uh, it's a USB, it's just a PowerPoint. Yeah, and so you'll see it on the projector. So uh, while I'm doing this, I guess I'll just introduce myself with my axe towards you. Is that okay? Fine. <laughs> the USB superposition is really hard. Okay. Um, so uh, I'm Alex Handy, uh, otherwise known as Vanguard. I don't know if anybody here goes back that far. Uh, I guess I'll look at the PDF and then it'll load. And now this computer is mine! Just fucking kidding. It's literally, I have this USB stick set up for the Atari SC at the Vintage Computer Festival a couple weeks ago. So, uh, my name is. Oh, I guess I'll go up here. Okay. Can you hear me online? My name is Alex Handy. I am a very old school noise printer. I was at some of the formula of meetings. I was there day one, like probably at 25th of all the stuff the old space went through my car to get there. Uh, and while I was at the old noise bridge in 2010, I was really inspired by the duocracy, right? The idea that if you want to do something, you can get a whole bunch of cool people together and they actually will all go in the same direction and work together. It's a really cool idea. So I found it. The Museum of Art and Digital Entertainment in Oakland it is a 501c3 nonprofit video game museum. It is located in Old Oakland. If any of you are familiar with Old Oakland, it is the Swans Market. And we are entering year 12, I believe. Year 11. No, yeah, and, uh, year 11 is ending September 27th. The video game museum is all playable. So that means all the systems have. Uh, SD card adapters, if any of you are familiar with Pricks or any of the EverDrive sort of stuff. We have each console set up on a CRT at least as long as it's finished. Uh, and we have SD cards plugged in. And because we are a nonprofit preservation organization, you can play any game ever. Not only do we have a game ever, but like we have them available for play on demand. We also have free party classes for kids. This is our big thing. We like to share the wealth of digital information with the and then knowledge is open, and by virtue of us being in Oakland, we are a very diverse body. We're not necessarily focused on diversity, but we are soaking in it, so we don't have to. Uh, the other thing we do offline, or rather online, instead of in meat space, is we resurrect old software stuff we can. We're currently working on the palace. Does anybody remember the palace? The smiling face chats? Okay. We well, all remember this, is, right? That's 1986. The Metaverse 1986 was Habitat. It was created by Lucasfilm Games. Oh. And uh, is there a speaker after me? I can go into this. Okay, so in 2013, game developers conference, we were doing it at uh, the Slut Old Games Industry. And I said to the guys who do the Lucasfilm exhibit, do you have to show the show from Habitat? And the guy wrote it, Chip Monkey who was then uh, Chief Architect of Pay Concept. Here you go, sort of. And I'm like, this is amazing. What do I do to do this? And he's like, <laughs> you fucking new. What are you? You can't possibly. This is written in PL1. Can you hear what PL1 means? Uh, programming language one? Yes. <laughs> Boom. So you can imagine all that is. It's from the 60s. All right. So uh, the other thing is right on Stratus EOS. Anybody ever heard of Stratus EOS? Okay. Stratus EOS is based on the multics. Multics? Multics! Yeah, it's a guy called multics. Multics is units. Units is unity, multics is many. So you would have a bunch of refrigerators inside the machine. You would put them in the base of your middle side of it. Just dump it. The other cells just go. And then online ran on stuff. And it was also called Chewley back in the day, Comic 64. Why have the film created this? He had it in source code in 2013. Today, you go to NeoHabitat.org to play a game. I'm on board for you. Sorry, yeah. This one, I was just having a meeting today. We just started to send some calls to Center for Law. We follow one screen, such as the DMCA. Anybody know what the DMCA is? 
you sir, like you're the fucking like teacher's pet here. You're gonna get the last of the survey. But the PSK, this is a millennium copywriter. Yes! And it's the sort of thing uh, when you start testing in front of the background, you stick a hand around the PCSS. So you're like, you can't take this piece of paper, it's legal, and some people don't have fucking you know, DCSS, right? And people look at us are crazy. So, but once uh, exemptions are exempted to the DMCA, so in 2015, you got an exemption along the archive that over the EFF, Harvard, a group of other people. The exemption said that if you have a game as far as online server validation, you go to a place, you'll play you can serve that back, you can serve the back. You can. You can be the PMs, not the idea, right? In 2017, 18, we need that conduct for the museum, who we heard that idea that it also for game plan and these people kind of kind of to me. So this year we we're working on some other ideas. If anybody has the ideas for the MCA that's around software, I'd love to talk to you afterwards because we're uh, we're brainstorming. We need you, especially teachers, our best teachers, Hayden's Noitrich, right? And they know this for years. We need you to come teach kids how to code. If you ask a child, do you want to program a video? Do you want to learn a video? The answer is always yes. There you go. Right. Uh, this is us. Oh man, we're good. Oh, I can't believe I was able to do a for that. So the five minutes Yeah. 
And so yeah, yeah we'll, we'll present the uh, we'll present post script for us. Let's give a hand to him. Thank you. Uh, oh, man, I'm not sure what it's about. Hey, you know, she's not sorry. Hey, hey. Hey, hey. Hey, yeah, let me, 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 yeah, so I am going to tell you about uh, the PostScript program language. Um, PostScript is a program language that is or was mostly found in uh, printers. The reason that they had a program language specifically for printers is because uh, at the time PostScript was invented, computers were much slower than they are today, um, and they couldn't actually handle high-resolution graphics. Which means that if you want a printer that can print high resolution graphics, you have a problem because your computer can't do high resolution graphics. Uh, so my dad bought his uh, laser writer in the early 90s. The printer, the CPU in the printer was, I believe, uh, twice as fast and had three times as much RAM as the computer he was using it with. Um, and was absurdly expensive. Um, but with all of that computing power, you could have the computer you're actually drawing the stuff on, rendering at low resolution so you could see what you're doing, and then when you print it, it would generate a little program and send it as basically a little bit of text to the printer, and then the printer could figure out, like, okay, uh, here I have the font, I know how to draw out, like, all of these pixels to get a 300 DPI image. Uh, so, with that introduction, I'm actually going to try to do some live coding as soon as I can find the share of my screen button. Yes. Uh, PostScript was one of Adobe uh, Adobe's very first products. Um, okay. So you should be able to see. Uh, I have a blank poster document on the left. Um, the, there's some comments at the top that just tell it, like, here's how big it is. Uh, text. How's that? Um, how's that? Is that legible for everyone? Okay. Um, so, uh, the way you write poster, I'm just going to write a poster program here. So. Zero, zero, move to uh, 50, 80, line to uh, stroke, whoops, stroke, no uh, so. um, And that draws a line from 0, 0 to 50, 80. It then strokes the line so you can actually see it, and then it shows the entire page. If I was doing this on an actual printer, show page is the thing that makes the page come out. Um, so you might notice a couple of weird things about programming language straight away. Uh, first of all, uh, arguments actually come before you call the function rather than after the way you, like, there's no parentheses. Um, that's because PostScript is a stack-based language, uh, like fourth, um, which is the sort of more famous example. So you put the arguments, then you put the function call, and it goes and looks at whatever you have to have. Um, the other thing is, and this is probably easier to see if I change this to, uh, say, uh, 3010, um, the origin, you notice this point up here didn't move, this point down here did. That's because the origin 0, 0 is actually in the bottom left corner instead of the top left corner, uh, because PostScript's coordinate system is based on, like, a mathematical, the mathematical coordinate system you get the upper left-hand quadrant of it on your page. It's very annoying when you're trying to draw text, because it's like normally you're thinking about top-down, we'd have to like move to the top of the page and then work your way backwards. 
Um, okay, so I'm going to make a slightly more complicated one. Uh, so 50, 80, line two, and then I'll do 60, 30, line two, and that draws another line, and I can do a close path to go back to where you started from, that draws another line, and then instead of stroking, I can do that. Um, and that fills it in instead of drawing out. Um, okay, so you have seen some graphics that you can draw. Um, now uh, I'm going to talk about like, I said it was a programming language. This isn't really programming. Um, so, and yeah, first of all, I'm going to uh, make my lines a little thinner so this will be easier to see. And then I'm going to declare a variable for you. Uh, and then once I've declared that variable, I can do um, x0 move to x. 100 line to stroke, and there's a, a line that goes from 10 0 to 100 0, or 10 0 to 10 100. Um, and now I can show you a variable definite de declaration, which is the thing I was going at here. Um, so I've declared a variable called x. The slash sort of escapes it, so it doesn't try and interpret it as a variable. Use Put the symbol, you put the value, you say def, and it looks at the last two things instead of x, and then you do that. And then you can change x. So I can say, for example, x, uh, 10x add def, uh, and then all of that over again. And now you get the line that's another 10 degrees over. Uh, the way, this, the way this works is I stick 10 on the stack, I stick X on the stack, which is also 10, I add them together. That takes the last two things off the stack, puts a 10 on the or puts a 20 on the stack, and then it works exactly the same as the original X10. Uh, you can also do loops. Uh, so you can do, I can say, uh, let's see, this up here, that's 10 def, um, curly brace, uh, move my variable down there, all this junk. Um, and now I've got 10 lines going all the way across the page because I set my variable. This is all my original code. This is you've seen already how to add it. And then this curly brace, the way it works is the curly brace puts a mark on the stack. This stuff all sort of gets put on the stack, not doing anything with it. This curly brace drops, pops all of this junk off the stack and turns it into a single thing you can call. And then repeat takes off of the stack uh, a number and a thing you can call and calls it that number of times. And so therefore we end up going all the way across the page. How, many, how much time do I have? Okay, I have, I've already gone over. Um, so I will do questions. What app are you interpreting Postgres in live? Um, I have a fairly, fairly complicated setup where I have a, a script that is run with I notify, like I notify runs a script that runs those scripts uh, and then generates it. And then my PDF viewer notices that the PDF has changed. So it's key, okay. <laughs> um, I, if you were just doing this normally, you wouldn't need to do this. But the reason I have that whole complicated script is because if I make a mistake, um, that script will actually render the error message for me, so I don't have to go and look at the terminal. Unfortunately, yeah, I didn't do that in this presentation, but I came prepared. <laughs> so, uh, so you mentioned that it's like the program that generates code to set up the printer. Mm -hmm. Was this MSD human writable? Uh, it. I mean, you can see it is in fact human writable. It. I don't know how much they intended that, how much it's just it's easier to design a language that way. Um, I do know there are definitely some programs that have been written by humans to generate. My favorite story is um, someone had an anecdote. Um, the, the, the printer in their office suddenly stopped working one day. Nobody could print anything. It was just sort of sitting there blinking, but as though it was trying to print, but not actually printing anything. And then about three hours later, it came out with a page with an extremely high resolution uh, render of man who brought that. Okay. 
Uh, I I don't either. I used it to write a bunch of papers in high school. It's it's some sort of cool kit library on top of text, and I only vaguely understand text. <laughs> um, it's uh, not actually related to so LaTeX works very differently. LaTeX sort of or text rather the output format is a thing called DDI, which is device independent. And that is just like a list of graphics instructions. It's not a programming language. And then the text you would run on a fairly powerful computer, you know, send it to the printer. Postscript was designed to be used for very low end computers to, to do it. So it doesn't have a bit of very good architecture. Any other questions? All right. Well, in that case, thank you for listening to my high speed rambling for the last 10 minutes. <laughs> only, only if she spends a writing a shell search. <laughs> um, how many, real quick, how many uh, people are? Uh, well, yes. All right, does anyone have, okay, so everyone here has presented a new thing. Um, is there anyone in mind who would like to present? Oh, shoot. Teacher, I hear you. Uh, did you say something? We could hear you. Would anyone want to present? Anyone? Online? Okay. Um, in that case, uh, a little bit of a break. I'll come to break now. I'm not Station Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, 
So the point of most like you have is you can interpret small. Yeah, I don't know how to be small. I don't know what to say. And yeah, so I'm really going to present this, uh, this, this, like, D1, not a spoiler, but a robot. Um, so yeah, what, what this is, is, um, so the model types, uh, so, so what I have here is a modified turbo chassis, uh, the motors here are directly attached to an H-bridge, uh, and then that is powered, or that's powered by battery uh, and driven by, you know, uh, which is taking information of these, uh, of these ultrasonics you see here. They're positioned along the front. Uh, the idea is that basically uh, the thing will observe, um, see something uh, in front of it, or like, Within a certain distance up, it will just turn to avoid it. So it's basically optical avoidance. Um, so, just on it. What's it say? Oh, damn, your names. That's true. Then I feel bad about dying. Oh, David, it's so bad. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know, we're also, at, we're actually thinking of the end goal of a robot in this bridge, uh, the goal of a robot is to have a mobile version of Mary. Um, so one idea was, one idea of the name is Mary Plan. Uh, uh, not, it's not really the game, it's not merged with Mary Plan from the sun. But, uh, yeah, it's sort of, How much Roomba is it? Oh, the Roomba is the thing that's the box at the bottom as well as the twirly wires. <laughs> it's uh, the wheels and the motors or those two? The wheels and the motors are part of the Roomba. Oh, okay. So. That's yeah, pretty good. Uh, 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 our screen. Our screen. Uh, you get to take out. You get to take out. Uh, uh, yeah, it's going to go power right now. Wait, you mean you're restraining it? It's got a restraining bolt on it, basically. Yeah. <laughs> How much faster can it go? Yes, come on. Is it probably better? What? Dear Lord. <laughs> it's going to be dangerous. I'm going to get into the nerf gun. Sorry, everybody. For a night. Let's have a pair. Let's have a pair. Oh, yeah, no, I have a pair. Let's have a pair. Then I see your sister being there. Yeah, I want to get into the little process. And the case you think I raise it so it only turns. Turns, uh, turns right. There you go. Nice. Yeah. Nice and short. Yeah. 
Yeah, hopefully, yeah, next up our program with a bit more intelligence, uh, perhaps do some like localization. Uh, so I, I've been doing a lot of like, ad based localization. Um, but go ahead and try and just do cable tags so that that's your pop. Uh, cable tags are more codes, but you will not find it. So 